Hey guys, thanks for tuning back into the podcast. We're glad you're here. Today, we're going to be talking all about great menu design. Not just the menu for graphics. We're talking about a menu that maximizes profit. It's no secret that when I ran restaurants, I was absolutely obsessed with profit. And I learned right from the get-go that you can either make a ton of money from your menu or lose a ton of money from your menu. You know, I work with lots of different clients and I routinely see that their menus are just thrown together and that there's often a huge difference in profit between this appetizer or that appetizer, this entree or that one. And there's a big spread sometimes, a big profit difference between what they're making on those items. And what we find out many times is their least profitable items are the biggest sellers. So why would you approach a menu that way? Instead, take a listen to the episode. I'm speaking with Mr. Mark Locks from a company called Hot Operator, and they specialize in menu design for maximum profit. We're going to walk through all the different steps on how you can put together a really powerful marketing piece that is a super profitable menu. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, engaging topics that help restaurants build their brands, rock their profits, and deliver amazing guest service experiences. Today, once again, I have Mr. Mark Locks. He is a profit pioneer and design engineer for Hot Operator. And we're going to specifically focus in on building a brand and rocking profits through menu engineering. Welcome to the show, Mark. How are you today? Hey, thanks, Roger. I'm doing terrifically. And today we're going to talk about Hobra, Get Them Tacos. Hobra is a really cool concept. It's got a, it's got two locations in Brooklyn and Staten Island, and it's got this beach vibe. It's a taco joint, and they need some help, and you're going to help them. You're in process of helping them now. Am I correct? That's right. That's right. Actually, what we did is, um, and this is how we start every menu engineering process. We start with a menu matrix. We break all the products down into four categories. We talked about that in the last podcast that we did together. Mm-hmm. And then we do a little background research on the restaurants. So we look at their demographics. Uh, we look at the uh, areas they're in. We also look at the responses on social media and what's going on there. And then we break down each category of the menu uh, into our scatter graph. So we're going to go through all of that information today. So hang on. It's going to be a, a wild ride. And, and a very important one because... You know, you and I both work and see restaurants all the time that haven't really thought through this process. And this this ain't just about putting pretty graphics on a page and letting the chips fall where they may. It's a real engineering process to maximize profit and deliver amazing results for restaurants. So I'm really, I'm sold because you and I worked together years ago. You achieved this for my restaurants many, many years ago. It was a tremendous success. So I'm really glad to have you on the show today and look forward to this whole process. Great. Thanks, Roger. Should we get started? Let's rock and roll. All right. So this is what I usually tell restaurant operators is that they, uh, they have a focus group going on in their restaurant every day. And people are voting with their pocketbooks and their feet. So they're deciding where they're going to go in the restaurant, whether they're going to eat there or not. And then they're also deciding, uh, they're also deciding what they're going to have. And so what we do is what we look for in a restaurant. We asked uh, Hobra, so Chris King sent us his uh, PMIX, his product velocity report. And what we did is we took that information. So these volumes you see here in this purple category, these are all the sales that he did in that particular, in his restaurants uh, over the last, uh, I think it was a two month period that he gave us this information for. And so if you see at the bottom here, we break it down into categories, small plates, tacos, entrees, burritos, naked burritos. So each category is looked at differently. And what we do is we break all this information down so that we can see what's a star, what's really moving, and what things are not moving. So you can see the different boxes, these different categories. And uh, what we're looking at is a couple of things. Number one, we're looking for, plot, uh, we're looking for uh, uh, plate contribution as opposed to to what a lot of restaurant operators look for, and that's uh, food cost percentages. The difference from our perspective is that we're interested in how much money can be generated to the bank. So how much cash can we take into the restaurant? And uh, percentages aren't gonna show you that, but certainly um, the whole dollars to the bank it come, you know, shows up here. A lot of restaurants confuse that, Mark, and I'm glad you're making that point because so many people put such a huge emphasis on food costs versus what each item contributes to the bottom line and profit that you actually take to the bank, and that's what you're explaining now. That's exactly right. 
Okay, so perfect. what we're looking for is to get as much cash to the bank as we can for the restaurant operator because um, when somebody goes into a restaurant, uh, you know, that's a butt in a chair, but we've got to make the rent when that happens. And so certain items uh, need to really generate a lot of income. Now, one of the things about the tacos, the tacos have really good solid volumes, but keep in mind, People do not buy just one taco. Most people buy two or three tacos. So when you take this all together, if you sold three Korean tacos as one order, you're actually generating something in, in the 10 to $12 range to cash to the bank. So that's actually a pretty good item. So it looks, it'll look like a cash cow or a plow horse here on this part, part of the, the matrix, but those items are actually doing better than they look because they're they're selling so many of them and you're eating them together as a, a combination thing. Whereas the burritos, most people do not order two burritos in a restaurant. So when you look at this and you say, well, the burrito only sold 450 uh, burritos in this particular sales period, that looks like it's a, a puzzle. But quite honestly, that's actually a pretty good seller for them. Do you understand the difference there? Because when you look at the tacos, you have to keep in mind, tacos and pizza are kind of similar that way. Like I'll talk to a lot of Italian restaurants and they'll say, well, you know, I love selling pizza because it makes me a lot of money. And then I'll say, well, you know, you've got to divide by three or four people though because pizza is usually something that's shared, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this case, the burritos do really well. Some of these things look better than they do. Um, the naked burritos, again, some of these things look really good too, um, even though they look like puzzles, which means that they're not selling as well as we'd like them to sell. They're actually doing pretty well. Does that make sense to you? It does, and you, you made another key point. One of the reasons when we had a wood-fired pizzeria is we only, well, two reasons. We had one size only because we didn't want people to split them. We wanted each person to order their own personal pizza, and it's the traditional way. If you go to Italy, they'll give you a one-size pizza. <laughs> right. No, that actually makes perfect sense, right? And then it can compete with an entree, right? Exactly right. Correct. Right. Now, when we look at small plates, and this is really incredibly important to keep in mind, small plates do not need to be stars. And the reason they don't is because they don't have to do the heavy lifting in the restaurant from a financial standpoint. So an incremental sale in a restaurant is an appetizer or a side dish, something that gets added to the entree. And the thinking behind it is this, a consumer is going into your restaurant, you know you're gonna sell, in this case, a taco or a burrito or a naked burrito or some entree of some kind. That's the reason they came in. If I can sell one of these small plates, if I can sell as an add-on some Baja corn or if I can sell an empanada or something else, that's an incremental sale. I'm gonna add that onto my taco order. And so I don't need to get the same amount of profit from this item because all this money goes directly to the bank. All the overhead is covered in the tacos. I knew I was gonna sell those to begin with. I didn't know I was gonna sell the empanadas in these um, small plates. So we'll get into that as we actually go through the PowerPoint that I set up for this particular restaurant operator. But before Perfect. we get there, what I wanna do now is just share the current menu with you just so you can see what the menu looks like and you can see um, what they did. Mm -hmm. And now are you seeing the menu? Uh, I was and now I'm seeing uh, sort of a file list. There we go. Can you make it uh, a little larger? I can. Now I'm seeing the menu. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Beautiful. So when you take a look at the menu, what you're looking at here is a, a menu that has decent design. I'm going to say it's okay. Uh, the problem with this particular menu is that, um, you know, if I'm in the restaurant, I already know that I'm at the Hobra <laughs> Get Them Tacos restaurant. So that big old logo doesn't need to be there. It does, certainly doesn't need to be there twice. <laughs> so we, our recommendation is, yeah, don't do that. Uh, secondly, you'll notice uh, we use something called positioning, highlighting, anchors, and numbers. So positioning where on the menu something goes has a huge impact on how well it's going to sell. In this case, all the stuff is pushed. You see how it's all pushed to the sides out here? It's all just kind of lined up on the sides. That's just crazy stuff right there because we're not making it about the food. We're making it about that whole bra logo that he's got in the middle there. And we're not really terribly interested in the logo at the moment. We're interested in what we're going to sell people. And then uh, the other thing is nothing's highlighted on this menu, so I'm not calling attention to anything. Correct. When a consumer goes into a restaurant, it's extremely important that we call attention to certain items because they're asking you what's good to eat here. That's what they want to know, and they want you to tell them. Make sense? So they're not doing that. And then uh, the mental anchoring, we'll talk about that. They're just missing this great opportunity. I could actually get about a about a 10% increase in sales in this particular restaurant without even taking a price increase. And in fact, 
if they don't want that money, I'll, I'll talk to Chris Kahin, just give it to me, I'll take it. Because consumers are leaving money on the table every time they buy like one of these Captain Jack tacos. They're leaving at least 29 to 49 cents on the table every time they purchase that item. And he's not asking for the money, it's just crazy, he's just leaving all this cash lay there. Does that make sense to you? Always does, yes. So far it's crystal clear. Now, can you see the, uh, the other side of the menu? This is the back side of the menu. Very well, thank you. Yeah. All right, so take a look at all these small plates are all lined up here, and then you've got the guacamole and the entrees kind of fighting for territory here. Got the kids thing going on, and then you got this uh, locally owned and operated, you know, the story's kind of over here on the side. Reverse text, by the way, is always a bad idea on a menu because um, the American consumer does not read uh, terribly well. This is not because they're stupid. I d it's because they just don't do it very often. They like to watch videos, that kind of thing. When you reverse type, statistically, you're going to reduce the, uh, the ability for a person to read. So you're just making it hard for them. Don't do stuff like that. And then if you take a look at the burritos, they, we're going to get into this. This is confusing as hell. I, I had to look at this thing for a real long time to figure out what the hell I was ordering. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here. When you look at the burrito right. category, right. there's a busy and lots of, of choices, right? Exactly. There's a bunch of choices. Now, there's a thing called a brand hijack, and that's perfectly okay, but this is not what that is. This is just a sloppy way of trying to introduce a whole bunch of stuff to somebody, and we'll get into that as I go through the PowerPoint. Does that make sense to you so far? It does. Let me ask you a quick question, and maybe yeah, you're going to get into this, and I don't mean to jump ahead. Uh, on your matrix before, we talked about, you know, some of these were stars, and some of these were puzzles, and some of them were plow horses, and, and this menu doesn't have anything called out or highlighted uh, with attention. Do you only recommend that, that stars be highlighted, or would you do plow horses and stars in some combination? Take us there. Sure. So what we look for when we're looking at a restaurant menu is we're looking for things that are going to emerge as a star. So we're looking for life. And what we're looking for are two things. One is that they can generate more money to the bank. So if, if it's something that can generate a higher than average profit, I'm going to highlight that item if I can. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing we're looking for is something that already shows signs of popularity. If something's not selling really well, it doesn't make sense to highlight it. You're probably, there's something probably wrong with that particular item. So we tend to look for an emerging star or something that's already a star on the menu. So in this case, you know, the quesadilla is kind of a star. It's, it's pretty decent to put some energy behind a quesadilla and actually make a category of that. Does that make sense to you? Yes, absolutely. And if we look at the tacos, there aren't any stars here because we, you know, again, I, as I explained before, you're buying two or three tacos together. And if you were, then this Korean, the Thunderbird, the Americano, those would be star items. I would probably highlight some of those. But the other thing that I want is something that can differentiate my restaurant from every other restaurant. So now you said before, when we were first talking before we started, this is kind of a, a Mexican restaurant. This is not really a Mexican restaurant though. This is a surfer taco joint. This is a California brand. And it's not a Mexican restaurant, which gives you a lot of really cool opportunity because I can put things on this menu that are going to generate interest and differentiate my business from every other Mexican restaurant that are going to make me stand out. Does that make sense to you? So yeah. like I can, do this, I can do this sunset thing going on here. I can do a Captain Jack which is just you know, kind of a cool way of naming something. And it's not Mexican at all. Captain Jack, that doesn't sound Mexican at all, but it works. And it works in this restaurant. The other thing I can do is I can add some fusion items to it. I can add a little Asian flavor. I can add a little bit of um, Street Smart stuff. I can add some really cool items to this menu that are gonna generate a lot of really fun interest in the business. So the other thing I look for in a star is something that I can make that my competitor can't make. So like at McDonald's, that's the Big Mac, right? The Big Mac is a trademarked item. I can't make that at my restaurants. There's no way to do that. Right. Does that make sense to you? Now, yeah. I'm not saying a Big Mac is a good product. I'm just saying that from a brand perspective, they're the only one that can make that. I made a, yeah, it was my mistake to call this a Mexican restaurant, probably because I owned a Mexican restaurant with a very similar vibe. But just to clarify my question, and, and not to confuse the audience, when I asked you about stars versus plow horses and, and calling attention to them on the menu, they're calling themselves a taco joint and all the tacos are in the plow horse category. So would the customer be confused if we're highlighting the stars that aren't tacos when they're gonna say, wait a minute, this is a taco joint, but they're not, calling, they're not highlighting the tacos. Why, don't they wanna sell tacos? Right. How no. would you handle that? 
Okay, so how I'm going to handle that is I'm going to highlight the whole category of tacos, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to hire, highlight specific items on the taco area that really stand out for me in this particular restaurant. So I want to differentiate my restaurant from everybody else's, mm -hmm. but we are a taco joint, and that is really where the bread and butter uh, is in the restaurant, and that's where the rubber heats meets the road. So even right. though these things do not look like stars, as I pointed out before, when you buy two or three of them together, yes. you definitely have a star in that category. Perfect. All right, I'm with you so far. All right, so now let's go to the review. And I'm gonna have to shoot this up here just to, to get this working so you can see it. And one more click and I'm there, hang on just a second. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Is that working for you? Yep, see the whole screen. All Here's right. The, so yeah, taco joints. And these are really cool. I mean, the buildings look really fantastic. I did a lot of, I spent a lot of time on social media looking at the menus and looking at uh, what's going on in the restaurant, what the buildings look like, what the build out looks like and all that. It's a fun, really a fun looking place. It's got street appeal. I would walk into that place just based on how it looks from the outside. I would too. All right. So what we did is we broke everything down and I showed you those matrices, those are scatter graphs, and that's what I work off of. And so stars, just as a review, stars are above average profits and above average uh, uh, ability to make money. So they're going to make you more money and they're also popular. These are items that we want to highlight if we can. Puzzles, these are under, uh, items that are underperforming from volume standpoint, but they make you good cash when they do sell. So I want to know, you know where these are. And they may be off brand or they might be too high priced. There's a number of things in categories that are just going to wind up in this category because they're probably just too high priced. And there's not a lot of money mental anchoring going on in this restaurant. So we'll get into that in a second. The plow horses, these are things that are above average movement, but below average profitability. But again, in this instance, the tacos, if you look at the taco, uh, it's going to show up as a plow horse, even though it is in fact a star because you buy two or three tacos together. Make sense? Yep. You've made that clear. Okay. The dogs, these put them back in the ground when you found them. They're off brand. They're just, they're not selling. And when they do, they don't make any money. So we can just skip these items. If you're going to cut something from the menu, that's where you start. So what we do is we start with a basic situation here. Uh, Chris King, he gave me a call. He asked, you know, he was looking for advice on how to make his menu better. He's got two locations, got very decent volumes, got this cool surfer look going on. He is poised for growth. I would suggest uh, to him that if he gets his menu worked out and he gets his systems right, he could franchise this restaurant and you could, you could have, you could see this be an emerging star. I mean, you could, you could see this as a, uh, you know, salt and peppering the countryside with these uh, Hobra restaurants, these, you know, there could be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. It's, it's a great, it's I a see. great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really excited about that for him. The burrito section is confusing. We're going to get into that. So is the small plates. Are they appetizers? Now, one of the things you got to keep in mind about an appetizer is an appetizer or a side dish needs to enhance the other purchase. In other words, um, he's got things in this category that don't belong there. And I'll talk about that in a second too. The next thing that I do is I look at the demographics for the location that they're going to be in, because I want to see if there's enough discretionary income in the market. And I also want to see what does it look like? What's, what does the person look like who might enter the restaurant? I'm very interested in this. So um, for the, the Bay Ridge uh, location, it's kind of the southwest corner of Brooklyn. If you look at Brooklyn, it's a very populated area. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of population there. The, the actual neighborhood he's in is 80, about 80,000 people. But if you look at the area, it's probably more like a few hundred thousand that could be customers for him. So it's a really good area there. The median household income 68 K. So there's plenty of discretionary income. Uh, he should be able to sell a lot of freaking tacos, which is great. Mm -hmm. It's considered high income for the area to relative to the other. And the, the, the unemployment uh, is low. So we're good. Everyone's working. They're doing good. Are they making as much as money as they'd like? You know, no, probably not. But the fact is they do have a little couple extra bucks in their pocket. They can definitely buy a burrito or two and they can do it a couple times a week. And that's what I was looking for. Uh, good reviews on social media overall, no management response. And I cannot emphasize this enough. When you're at your restaurant and somebody comments about your restaurant, answer them. If it's a good one, say, thanks for the comment. We really appreciate it. Can't wait to serve you again. If it's a bad one, comment on that too. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, definitely, oops, well, this is jumping all over the place. 
So definitely, uh, four stars in Yelp is decent. That's better than average. Uh, some service issues, and we, you know, I would, talk, I would talk to Chris about those because you need to work on the service issues. Service in a restaurant is so important. If you've got customer complaints about somebody being mean to you in a restaurant, there is no place for that in your restaurant. TripAdvisor, uh, with only four stars, a little lower than average, but it's still fine. Facebook has very decent following. Uh, we recommend advertising to increase the fan base there. Put a little money behind it. You could do something pretty cool here with it. Four point six, uh, six stars on Facebook is very good. That's, that's excellent. We like that. Um, we need posts for him that are, have a little more post engagement. So one of the problems with his posts is people are just not responding very much. He's, you know, he'll, he'll get maybe like two shares. He's showing this beautiful photograph of food and there's maybe two shares and four or five likes and he's got 6,000 followers. So there's something definitely not working there and we need to, you know, if it were me talking to him right now, I'd be saying you need to, you know, do some work on that. And we could talk about that after we get the menu working for you. Yeah, one of the things that worked great for us was our staff were having so much fun and they enjoyed meeting new people all the time that they were making, you know, so many posts a week. And everyone has a follower that works in your restaurant. If they're on social media, it's a, it's a free way of getting, you know, great uh, reviews and getting great posts out to the audience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the demographics for the Staten Island is a larger population, about 468K, which is decent. Uh, good median household income, 73K. This is not as high, it would seem like it'd be higher than the Bay Ridge location, but the fact is the housing is a little more expensive here. So this is, it puts a little bit of a crimp on the discretionary income, but there's still plenty of people in this market that can spend plenty of money at restaurants eating burritos. And that's all we're looking for is to make sure that there's not something that's holding us back. Make sense? Absolutely. So far, so great. Okay. The reviews here were slightly lower. So uh, 3.5 stars in Yelp, that's actually pretty much average for a restaurant, but it's lower. Solid four stars on TripAdvisor is decent. Promotional hiccups are causing the problem, specifically Taco Tuesday. I had a number of people who commented that they have this special Taco Tuesday thing going on and uh, that they were confused by it, that certain things were not offered. There was a limited menu for that. You have to be really specific when you're doing a promotion on social media or if you're doing a promotion at all, make sure there's no confusion. One of the things that really will piss people off, they get there and it's like they feel like there's a bait and switch or something fussy going on in the background. Exactly. So make sure you pay a real close attention to that. Again, no management response at all to this problem. So that's a real issue here, especially with this Taco Tuesday. Someone should have said, hey, you know, come on back in. I'll give you a free couple of tacos. And by the way, the Taco Tuesday is this specific thing and kind of, you know, you, this is a real easy thing to fix, but there was nobody there talking about it. And I, you know, shame on them for not doing it. Well, the impact is just, you know, ongoing and it just exacerbates the problem if there's no response. Exactly. People are going to talk. Unfortunately, negative impressions just kind of spread like wildfire and that's going to hurt the restaurant. Exactly. That's exactly right. So the next thing that I do is I just take a look at the design engineering overall, the logo and the web illustrations. By the way, if you look at their website, I would recommend going there. They've got some really cool stuff going on with some graffiti and some really cool illustrations. I love that stuff. It didn't wind up on the menu and I'm really disappointed because the menu could be something really cool. And what you want with your menu is you want your customer to look at the menu when they hold it and they go, wow, this is really neat. I want to, this is just a really a cool menu. This menu is not that. This menu is, you know, it's kind of boring. It's bland, honestly. No highlights at all, bad idea. You wanna highlight things and then you wanna drill it into your server's heads that you know these highlighted items are the ones that we wanna sell. So if somebody asks what's good here, you point to a highlighted item and you say, sell that, that's what I wanna sell. The burrito sections I talked about before is completely confusing. They're, the brand hijack idea is a really good idea and especially for this restaurant. So if somebody comes in and orders something really wicked off the menu and it, it becomes a local kind of a local legend item, I highly recommend going after that, but this is not what that is, and this isn't working very well for them. By the way, they have more than one tagline in there, and that's just a distraction, so pick one, go with that, and uh, you'll be better off. You want your tagline, by the way, to describe your business in a way that makes a little aha moment for your customers so they get that connection between Hobra is a cool place. Get them tacos, I don't know. Life, liberty, and tacos, maybe that's better. I don't, I don't know. That's got a, a nice East Coast feel to it, So, um, but pick one, stick with it. Then I start talking about the brand. So the brand, there is a brand essence here, but it isn't being expressed in the menu and there's a real problem with that. So the brand essence is this kind of cool surfer dude kind of thing and I absolutely love that as a concept. I do not love the menu because it does not express that. The text is minimalistic. I'm guessing they wrote it themselves. Uh, 
you know, the more you tell, the more you sell in this case. Uh, you need to give it a flavor and a voice. So I'm thinking like a blonde surfer guy, uh, somebody who's got a really cool kind of accent and, you know, let that come through on your menu. This requires a professional writer, somebody who can write that and add a little comedy to it would be just fine too. The menu, the current menu does not have any of that going on. The menu could be larger, more interesting. I would make this thing big. You know, surfing is big, surfboards are big, it's cool, it should have a fun, interesting menu with lots of little details in it. Let's get some graphic elements in it and make the menu more fun so when people look at it, they go, man, this is freaking wicked cool, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Agree completely. All right, so then what we do is we start to break it down a little bit further. As we do these matrices, we take a look at each category and we start to helping you kind of figure out like how we're gonna sort this whole thing out and develop a menu. So this is really our creative brief. This is what tells us what the creative brief is gonna look like and what the, what the menu might start to take shape looking like. <coughs> Pardon me, excuse me. So the small plates, quesadillas do not belong in this section. They are not a small plate. They are actually the same size as a burrito. It's just folded differently. Uh, I've worked with a lot of Mexican restaurants, a lot of restaurants that are uh, casual theme restaurants that have quesadillas. They're never eaten as an appetizer. It's just not how people eat those. My recommendation is make a category for this, get it out of there. So they sell well, it's a great item. They make good money. It's like printing money in the basement. I love it. Let's do something with it. The guacamole is a good seller too. Love that. If the, cheaps, if the chips are free, this is a great way to cover the cost of the chips. I don't know the person who invented giving away chips at Mexican restaurants, but we should go back in time and, you know, just kill them. I mean, this is just stupid. Why are you giving chips away? I hate that. But in Mexican restaurants or Mexican seeming restaurants, if you, if you sell a taco, you pretty much got to give them some chips to go with it. So there you yeah, go. It's a given and it's done a disservice to anyone starting a Mexican restaurant because now the public just expects it wherever they go and then they diss you if you don't. Right, exactly. So if the chips are free, do something with the guacamole, do something really cool with, the, with other dips, those kinds of things. Cover the cost of the chips. Comments on social suggest they need improvements on the nachos. Um, I came across that a couple of times. If it were me, the nachos should be a really interesting, cool item. And uh, you could do some really fun stuff, especially with like a, you could do like a mini surfboard with the nachos on the mini surfboard. That would be really cool as it came out, people look at it and go, oh, that is really really cool yeah that's a hook for sure i love hooks you can't have too many hooks in a cool right. mm -hmm. so odds and ads anything incremental in the restaurant i can add is a really good idea they do this thing with sweet sweet corn with a, a street corn um it seems like it would be seasonal to me like frozen corn on the cob can get a little mushy although i honestly uh i had this experience a while back we worked with uh green giant fresh like uh, and uh, during the summertime when sweet corn is available throughout the Midwest and you get this really lovely sweet corn that's just got this nice crispy sweetness to it, their frozen sweet corn would sell like crazy at that same time. So I don't know, maybe people don't care and, and they'll eat anything. I, I get that. So the street, the street corn doesn't sell very well. I might make that a, a seasonal thing if I were them. That would be my recommendation. The frozen corn uh, I mean, the empanadas, they sell pretty well, and there's some, uh, you could use some fusion there. I think they're trying to be too uh, traditional. You're not a traditional uh, Mexican restaurant, so you don't really need to stay that way. So what I would do is introduce a melted cheese of some kind, like um, make it into a cheese stick, like a little empanada cheese stick with some Mexican cheeses on the inside of it. And then um, <coughs> add like a dip to it. Like maybe add a, a a raspberry jalapeno sort of spike dip or something like that to make it to make it more interesting. Uh, when I talked to Chris about this, he said that the ceviche was being offered as an in-out promotion. So I would have said drop it, but he doesn't have it on the menu now anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, incremental sales again, the mac and cheese, it's just odd for this business. It needs to either make it fit, you need to either make it fit the brand or 86 it. I'd, I'd either get rid of it or make it fit better. The J Bay salad, um, it's on there, it's an overlap, it's not selling well. I'm not sure what you're doing, what he's doing with this, and we talked about it a little bit. I said basically, look, you could do a salad category, and it's really easy to do with a lot of things he's doing with this naked burritos, that kind of thing. So if it were me, I might either make it something cool or get rid of it. Um, it's not an anti-veto. Now, when I talk about an anti-veto in the restaurant, you know, you get four people in a car and they go, hey, let's, let's go over to Hobra and have dinner. And then one person in the car goes, nah, I don't, wanna, I don't want a burrito. There's nothing there for me. Oh, and then somebody goes, well, have the JB salad. You know, you like salads. That's a, it's a good option. This isn't working that way. So 
it's not an it's not an anti veto item, so I don't know what you do with it. Um, but so if there's no emotional attachment to the salad, I get rid of it. Um, you need to make everything on the menu special, different, and better in some way. I'm copying that from Coca-Cola, but you know they'll they'll give me a break on that, I'm sure, because I'm giving them a plug. Hey, um, I, I agree. Yeah. And this is just an extension of the naked brown. Uh, the other thing I would do, like with the mac and cheese, I was thinking, well, could you know, make it a mac and cheese nacho or could you make it mac and nacho cheese or something? Like do something that makes it more seem like it fits. I don't have a problem with the mac and cheese. It's not selling very well, but it needs to be done in a different way. And it needs to add, you need to add something to make it interesting. Yeah, we had a tremendous <coughs> amount of success selling lobster mac and cheese at a very oh, nice lobster. price. I love lobster on the menu. Yeah, lobster on a menu was fantastic. It just it shoots the prices way up. People think it's a, it's an expensive item already, so they're ready to shell out cash. And even if you have a forty eight or a fifty percent food cost, you're going to take you know fifteen yeah, twenty bucks. Absolutely right. It just generates cash. I love that stuff. Um, so what I would do, this is my recommendation for add-ons: make more empanadas if you like. Make one with mac with a Mexican cheese, like make it into a cheese stick. Add a, a raspberry pepper jelly dip to go with it. Add options for the guacamole. They have two or three different kinds of that. I would make a bean dip of some kind, make it wicked good, really ter terrifically good. This has really got to be something that people want to, you want something good enough that people want to throw it on the floor and roll it like a dog. I mean, you really want something good. Um, I've never seen plantains were well, you know, they're not, you're no exception here. If it were me, I'd take them off. Um, it's certainly not working and you don't need it. Uh, I'd expand the nachos, add a couple of options and I would drop the ceviche, but I already said that. So we're good. Make sense so far? Any questions on apps? No, that's all perfect. Okay. Very clear. All right, let's talk about the tacos. This is really the best category and with significant sales. So I love this category. Uh, my guess is more people are buying more than one. It's not really a guess. That's an educated guess, I would say. I'd put it there. The California fish tacos could use a highlight. That's what I would highlight on the menu. I'd put a lot to it. People seem to like the fun names, so I'd do more of that. Um, there's so much money left on the table with dollar pricing. I hate that dollar pricing in a restaurant like this one. I could add 49 cents to every damn thing they sell in this restaurant and no one would complain or even notice. Think about how much more revenue that would be on an annual basis just adding 49 cents an yeah. item. Yeah, in his restaurant, it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is cash. I mean, hey, listen, give it to me. I'll take it. If you don't want it, man, it's just... You know what's happening is the guest is leaving 49 cents on the table and you're sweeping into the freaking trash. It's just crazy. Uh, fusion items work well. So this Korean is really a good seller. There's a pretty good Asian following in the market. Do more of that. Do some interesting things. What if you did like a, a bomb me taco? Like take the bomb me, you know, like the, that uh, uh, lovely uh, uh, Asian French kind of mix and make it into a taco. That'd be really interesting. With a really cool name and it would sell. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I think it really is. And, you know, right now the Bon B, you know, it's really interesting. I was just doing a restaurant. We were just working at another restaurant uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, he's like a, an Irish pub and he's got a Bon B on his sand and it's, it's one of his best sellers. I mean, it's, that's a, um, uh, uh, that's a Vietnamese dish. How it's working there, I have no idea, but it is working really well. So uh, let's add some more ethnicity to the group and have some fun with this. Uh, better description here to help. Uh, I like, I like uh, the Cali coleslaw. I don't know what it is, and I think we should tell people what that is on the menu. Um, what makes it Cali? Why is that different? Why do you want to have this? And then charge a little something for it to get people to add it. Position on this menu is really, really bad. So if we set this menu up, what we're going to do is we're going to position the menu correctly so that the right things are in the right place. And it's going to, it's going to smooth out your throughput in the restaurant. So you're actually going to wind up with a, a smoother running operation after we're done with this. Let me ask you a question, Mark. When, yeah. when we reposition items, is it going to make sense to keep the horizontal format versus a vertical top yeah. to bottom format? Yeah, I can work with that if there's a reason you want that. I mean, we can make that work. Uh, I like uh, I like a, 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 a vertical format a little better in this restaurant because it's a front to back menu mm -hmm. and that tends to work a little better. I can work with either one. So, but what's really important is the center of that page is really critical. Right now you're selling your logo, but people do not come in and say, oh, I'll have a Hobra, uh, a Hobra logo and a, and a Coke. I mean, no one's going to do that, right? They're not ordering that. What are they ordering? They're ordering tacos. Taco, or burrito. Taco, taco. Yeah, so what should be in the center of that category? Burritos, food, baby, right? Um, 
I like the life, liberty, and tacos better. I'd use that. I don't know that. Get them tacos. Unless the people say that, I don't. I'm not nuts about that. But, but you could take a 10 percent increase without even taking a price increase, and nobody would care. So if you don't want the money, again, I'll take it. I'll. I, I will definitely work for the incremental in sales. Good mix of items. I like that. I like. I would just remake the categories a little bit. Uh, pl place highlights in there. You need a mental anchor point on this menu. You need something like a 12 pack of tacos, mix and match, have some fun with this. You need a price point that's somewhere in the $40, $50 range just to make that $5 taco look cheap. Just had uh, an idea. You know how they do sliders <laughs> or flights of beer where you can taste multiple different beer types? What if you did a flight of tacos where every it. plate came with like four tacos and they were all different? Yeah, that's a that's a great. I love that idea, especially mm -hmm. because that gives you that price point that you're looking for. Exactly. And honestly, you know, I can go to Taco Bell and I can get a taco for a buck. So how am I going to get six bucks or five bucks or four bucks for a taco? Well, I got to convince people that it's worth it, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, the whole thing is about value proposition. So when you get this flight of tacos, I think that's fun, especially if it comes with beer. That'd be terrific. I would tell a better story. I like the story. It's not terribly well written, and we would use professional writers. You need a little more poetry. I mean, you need prose, right? When you write a menu, you're talking to people. You're, you're convincing them you've got something that's better that somebody else has, and you're giving people a mental picture. And so let's tell a good story. And then the other thing is better descriptions are going to help you sell more food. Um, right now, the descriptions are just too minimalistic. They're not giving me any reason to purchase anything from this menu. I mean, you're, you're just not convincing me. So yeah. Put some energy, baby. Get some, you know, uh, what I always find funny is, you know, you, put all, you see all these restaurant operators, they put a crash ton of money, crap ton of money, money into everything in the restaurant and then they go, I'll just make the restaurant, I'll just make the menu myself and see, you know, I'll save a thousand bucks. Well, you know, it's, it's dollar wise and, or penny wise and dollar foolish is what it is. Because- Would you recommend the descriptions on the highlighted items that really bring those to life to really put more emphasis on those things that generate absolutely. cash? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're going to sell something you really want to sell, put energy behind it, right? The more I talk about something, and this is an old sales thing. When I went through sales college at the University of Wisconsin, one of the things the sales guys, these old sales guys, they'd be like, the more you tell, the more you sell, baby. Tell, tell me, why should I buy it? Explain it to me. I want to know. And actually, what's really interesting is I can change your mind about a product. Let's say I've got two pieces of pie. The pie on the left is apple pie. The pie on the right is Grandma Lee's before the war pie. And the pie on the right, General Lee had this lovely recipe. And everywhere he went, he took this recipe with him. When he died, he had that recipe in his lapel pocket. It was grandmother's recipe for apple pie. Now, which pie do you want to eat? That one. The grandma's that one. And guess what? You'll pay more for it. And guess what? You'll do it more often. Yep. Tell me a reason. Give me a reason to buy this. And it's, you know, what do you go, when you go to a movie, what do you get, Roger? Entertainment. Entertainment, right? I get a memory. That and expensive popcorn, right? What did I just sell you with my tacos? I sold you a story. Why is this taco better than any other taco? Why is it cool? Now I got to convince you that. All right, let's talk about the entree. By the way, since I, I grabbed this off their website. Isn't that a cute illustration? Just love that stuff. Where is this on the menu? Yeah, it's grooving. You're freaking missing it, man. Where is this stuff? All right. <clears throat> By the way, if you do a cool enough menu that people start stealing them if they're made of paper, mm -hmm. I, I love that because they take it home and they keep it. I want my advertising in their house. Every time they wake up, they look at my menu. How much, my chances of them coming to my restaurant just went up. So don't worry about stuff like that. Just make sure that when they do steal it, it's not there's not stealing in menu jacket or cover. Yeah, you alluded to that earlier. It's like the front of that menu had two different logos with that giant tagline that was taking up so much valuable real estate. Why not replace that just with the cool bus that I is know. the image I of the place? The I, know. I know. When I showed this to my creative director, she looked at me and she goes, oh my God, what a great missed opportunity. Holy crap. Yeah. It was wow. like, I could do so much really cool stuff with this menu. It would, it would be so cool. All right. Entrees. There is this little tiny section with fajitas in it and a bunch of other things that I have no idea what are doing there. So anyway, not enough in this category. Categories statistically need to have seven items. It's a bell curve. Six sells more than five. Seven sells the peak. Eight sells less than seven. If you want the best category, make it seven. If it were me, the fajitas could use, uh, they could just be a thing that's reinvented. 
you reinvented the taco, you reinvented the burrito. Why didn't you reinvent the fajita? You just missed this great opportunity. And fajitas, by the way, bring a premium. If I order fajitas in your restaurant, it comes out sizzling, baby. I love that stuff because you can charge more. Right. You can put shrimp, you can put lobster, you can do a lot of really creative stuff. What about, a, what about a, that Korean fajita? That would be amazing, right? That's what I do, high profit there. Exactly. Why only with only three, nobody's buying any of this stuff. So you could introduce Mexican rice bowls if you wanted to. You could make a, a fajita rice bowl. You could do all kinds of stuff. You could is is that what the new he's got something called a naked burrito. Is that what that is? Maybe that's what that is, and that just is in the wrong category. I don't know. But if it were me, I would reinvent this category. There's a lot of potential here because the fajitas show some signs of life. Not huge signs of life, but you know they're being missed. But it's so, another hook, you know, when it goes through the dining room and you can see it and you can hear that sizzle <laughs> of the pan and all that kind of stuff, it sells yeah. itself. Imagine this. Imagine if we teach your servers to do a little fajita dance and maybe do a little chant every time some fajitas go out. They do a little chugga chug of fajitas all the way to the table. People right. would be like, I want that. Exactly. Cool. So make it entertaining for people. I'm on board with that. All right, if it were me, I'd reinvent fajitas. I'd introduce fusion to this category. Uh, fajitas with salsa, with a spicy peanut sauce. Uh, peanut sauce. I would do a drunken fajitas with a splash of tequila. I don't know if they have alcohol on staff. Maybe they can't do that, I don't know. Um, uh, Tamalus fajitas, a steak fajitas topped with a sombrero. Uh, I would do something interesting. I'd make a surf city fajita, uh, <clears throat> maybe with some sea seafood and some, some sort of a crema or some other. Kind of thing, I, I, you know, some really cool things you could do with this category. Love the category. I just don't think they're doing it right now. No, jazz it up. All right, let's talk about burritos. All right, I'm confused. And a confused person never buys anything. If I confuse you, what are you going to do? You're going to walk away. Are you looking for a brand hijack? Because if you are, this is not what that is. A brand hijack is best described when you go to, uh, what's the burger joint, uh, In-Out Burgers in California. They got like four things on the menu, but 50 ways to buy a burger, right? Is that what this is? Because that's not what this is. Right now, you got way too much complication and it makes it really hard to get these burritos sold. And I like the burritos as much as the tacos. You make good money on these things. Now there are named burritos and then there's naked burritos and a lot of Mission Bay burritos popularized in San Francisco in the 1960s. So are they all Mission Bay burritos? Is that what you're doing? Because if that's what you're doing, you need something that says Mission Bay, this is what it is, this is why we do it, this is why it's better, right? Absolutely. Does that make sense, Roger? Did I lose you? No, 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 I'm right on board with that. Okay, so are some burritos just burritos? We need to figure this all out and that category needs some work. So if it were me, uh, I would take a note from the whole brass tacos, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Let's keep this simple. Let's bring in the Mission Bay to the East Coast. Love that. I like the surf. That's great. Love that. But it needs a story to go with it. People like things when, better when they understand them. So let's help them understand what this is all about. And um, it's not so much what you offer. It's about how you're offering it. So I would position Highlight Anchor this whole category. I would position it better on the menu because right now it's kind of an after this little tiny box up in the upper right hand corner. And it's like your best, one of your best selling categories. What the hell is that about? Um, I would make all of the items named items. So there's none of this Mission Bay ad chicken kind of BS. I don't know what that's all about, but people don't want to, in, you know what? People don't like to do that kind of thing. When I look at menus, I look at them all the time. People are like, oh, I want to have just a build your own pizza. Yeah, all right, let's do a build your own pizza. Why would you make your customers work? You know, put on a few nice pizza. If somebody wants it and they don't want that, they'll just say, look, take that part off and you leave it off. No big deal, right? Let's move you on. They'll get the money for it. Exactly. Exactly. So let's tell people what burritos you want, why you want them, and this is why we made it this way. If you don't like that, hey, you can have whatever you want. I'll make it for you. You want a peanut butter and jelly burrito? Fine. I'll even go out and get the peanut butter and jelly and put it in there. You want a little cream cheese with that? I mean, I'll do anything you want, but this is what I recommend. Yes. Make sense? Rock and roll. Mm -hmm. All right. Naked burritos. Isn't that a cool, by the way, isn't that cool? That is really a cool graphic. Where is that on your freaking menu? I mean, you missed this great opportunity. I don't know what you're thinking. I know. It's true. All right. it too. These were so naked, I couldn't find a picture of them, which is why I put that picture where I did, because I'm like, this naked burrito thing is cool, but I don't know what it is. Tell me, what is that? Is that a bowl? Is that a plate? Do I get rice and beans with it to hold it all together for me? 
Yeah, yeah. and I've asked a lot of questions of the staff. Okay, what is it? What's a naked burrito? What's in yeah. it? You know, what does it look like? Right, and in this sort of limited service or quick service kind of a deal with these burritos and tacos, transaction speed is really huge. Do we want to be having conversations with our servers? We do not. We want the service to be saying, look, I recommend this and getting you stuff and making happy customers and making people through the rest, getting people through restaurant quickly so we can change this, right? Love the additions, just need more information. Some of these items sell pretty well, it's pretty amazing. You know, people are finding it, so they like it. So if we do something with this to make these uh, stand out, we make the, make the naked burrito, I love the idea, I love the whole idea, especially with the, with the uh, San Francisco Bay, you know, Mission Bay kind of concept that works great. Um, it just needs to be talked about, that's all. The naked Bobo could use a highlight. Uh, the naked Duke is cool too, like it, don't know what it is. We gotta tell them a better story about it. What is the X? I don't know. Is that a larger portion? Is that extra meat? I don't, you know, they, they sell well. They're on the, uh, they're in the matrix. What is that? Tell me what it is. Why do I want an X? Uh, the combined sales of burritos make this a really good category and it could be so much better. You know what? You could be, uh, you can be uh, tacos all you want, but I'll tell you what, you make more money on a burrito. I just do burritos if you could do it. All right, here's the next steps, baby. We're getting to the bit end here. Here's the meat. Yep, this is what we're gonna do on the menu. We're gonna take a look at some new offerings. So now you've got some homework to do. Some of the things we talked about, some other things you gotta make it fit your category. When I offer things, uh, Roger, in a restaurant, I'm doing it from a marketing perspective. You and your chefs and your cooks have to make it fit your restaurant. In other words, I may say, look, do this empanada with cheese and make it gooey and all that stuff. How do you make that work? Should that be, uh, should the crust have a little powdered sugar on it to make it sweet? I don't know. Uh, maybe you want to do a salsa, but I think it needs to have a sweet with the salty. I think that's better. Women, you know, get excited about that. So I push you in that direction. You got to make it work. So make a look at some new offerings. Fan your menu. menu. Positioning, highlighting, anchors, and numbers. Don't try this at home, kids. It's not something you can just do on your own. Positioning, where on the menu something goes has a huge impact on wallet sales. We can help you with that. Highlighting, I need to call attention to things to get you not thinking about money, but instead thinking about value, what's good to eat here. That's the mental anchoring, the highlighting. Which things do I call out? And then the numbers. Stop with these whole prices. Five bucks is a dumb place to stop. I have an argument with that. When you raise a price, like, here's the thing. If you raise your prices in a restaurant, this is a fact. The, if you go up in price, you will have people who are going to stop buying some. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? That's just it does. It's, straight it's not just one thing. Uh, training the staff to recommend those items that you've positioned, highlighted, and are anchoring that menu. That's exactly right. So if I go to five bucks, that's a point where a consumer is going to get pissed off. I may as well get paid for their anger, right? Oh, you went to 550. 550 is 599. Get over yourself. Just go to the next price point. I'm going to fight with you either way. My sales volume is not going to change if I go up that extra 49 cents. Yep. You may as well have it. Round it up. Exactly. Better design will give you a better product. Consumers will complain less. They'll like the food better. They'll love you for it. Do something great with it. And I want people to steal your menu. If it's cool enough to, for people to walk out with this paper menu uh, in your restaurant, that's good. It's advertised. It's taken home. It's like wearing a t-shirt. Yeah, by it's the, a powerful marketing piece in your restaurant. Exactly. And by the way, if you wanted us to, we could merchandise the holy bejesus out of this restaurant. It's got some really cool stuff going on. We could do t-shirts, hats. We could do mugs. We could do all kinds of really cool stuff that people could take with them. You could have, I'll bet you, you could probably do per restaurant a couple of hundred grand a year just in merchandising that people would love all that stuff. It's just yeah, that's a lost opportunity. It's another profit center that, you know, brands like this, if they're missing out on that, man, that's leaving, you know, just tons of money on the table also. Yeah. All right. Write some good copy. Write some good copy with a good copywriter. Don't do this yourself. <laughs> I mean, I just, it pisses me off. There are so many good writers out there that need work. Get a, get a good comedic writer or get somebody to write it. We got a staff full of uh, writers who've got, you know, advertising awards and all kinds of notoriety. They are fantastic. They could write the hell out of this menu. Make the menu, menus more similar. Don't have them all different. So we got to put them all together and make sure that when your concept is a thing, like if you go to, if you go to a Taco Bell, you go from one Taco Bell to another Taco Bell, <coughs> do you have a different menu? Consistent. 
Yeah, it's consistent. What, what the hell is it with that? Oh, well, well, you know, in Staten Island, it's different. No, it's not. No, it's not. Your brand is the same. Wherever you go, that's the same. Introduce some cool illustrations from your website and the graffiti. The graffiti is really cool. Love it. Strategically price the menu. We can do that for you. My, uh, my experience with this is that restaurant operators, um, they tend to be uh, sort of like uh, low self-esteem or something when it comes to their menu. They don't, they don't charge quite enough. Now, having said that, I know the industry is really getting hit hard right now. The restaurant industry is down in overall uh, foot traffic by, I don't know, a couple percent. The National Restaurant Association just came out with this evidence the other day. And people are taking a price increase and sort of, you know, like the sales, uh, the profits are up a little bit, but their traffic is down. This is not a sustainable direction to go. But as I pointed out before, if we strategically price this menu, we're going to do this without taking a price increase. Make sense? It does. Yeah, you want to dominate your competition and be so creative and resourceful with your marketing through your menu, through the hooks, through the presentation, all that stuff that you want to steal from the, you know, steal market share. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So That's those are my building at its best right there. Yeah, exactly. So this is my recommendation for them as a restaurant. What we would do next if we went, if we move forward with this, and I'm guessing we probably will with, with Chris, um, is we write the menu. And we set all the prices, we develop all the categories. At the same time, our creative director is working on some looks, like what should the style of the menu look like? How big should it be? What, what plat platform should it be? What do those graphics look like? Once the text is all approved and we go through that all together, there's a lot of going back and forth. Once they try out some of the new items and they test them to see if they're working, then we do something called a full and final where we put everything together in one nice big package. So you look at the menu and that's the way it's gonna look on the menu, on the tables. They're still going back and forth there. So the customer is still involved in that entire process. They say, yeah, this isn't working. I don't really care for that one so much. That kind of thing, we go back and forth. Once it's ready, then you get it printed and launched. Now, when you launch the menu, you need to do a big launch promotion. So you want to launch the menu on social media. You want to train your servers so they know what they're supposed to be highlighting, what they're supposed to be promoting. And you want to kick it off, get some energy behind it. So that when your menu goes out there, everyone's on the same mindset. Everyone has got the same idea about what we want to have happen in the restaurant. And then this is what I hear from restaurant operators that call me up and they go, God, I got a 15, 16% increase in profitability in my restaurant. And People, complaints are down, people are excited, they're loving the new menu. That's what you want to hear. Does that make sense, Roger? There's so much impact to all this. It's, uh, I'm so surprised that every operator doesn't, they have to do this, right? What's the <laughs> yeah. point? Oh, they don't them, them, unless they a lot of them don't. I know, I don't get it. I, you know, I hear restaurant operators all the time, they'll say to me, well, I want to take this off the menu, you know, it doesn't sell, and I'll do a matrix, and we look at it, and they'll go, holy crap, I had no idea. <laughs> that that Data that operators just aren't even looking at, they're not running regular product mixes, they're not looking at their plate costs, they're not seeing which items are the most profitable, they're not doing the highlighting thing, they're not training their staffs. I mean, I see it every day, and it's, it's hard enough to run this business without that kind of a mindset, you know, and an approach to the business. You got to do this stuff. And think about this. I went through this with them. The, uh, we, we looked at the demographics in this market. Yeah. We took a really good hard look at each category, what's working, what's not working. We looked at the reviews on social media. There is enough energy here from a marketing standpoint that he could probably take his two and a half or two and a quarter million dollar restaurants and make them three, three and a half million dollar restaurants in the next year. Now, What's it going to cost them to do that? A couple of grand, a few grand of consulting time between you and I. I mean, what? what, what are, seriously, would you, <clears throat> would you spend three, three thousand, four thousand bucks for consulting to make another million dollars next year? Right. Tiny investment for a huge ROI. Why, why the hell wouldn't you do it? It doesn't make any sense to me. But I, hey, listen, I got a lot of customers, uh, and I got a lot of restaurant operators who are doing extremely well right now. So yeah. we're we're good. I mean, you know, and I'm, you know, like you. We're only a few guys, so can't do them all. <laughs> we can do more. And if you want some help with it, you know. It's true. You know, a lot of operators are so close to their restaurants that they don't see the missing pieces. Exactly. You know, take a step back, take a fresh look, a fresh approach to every way that the customer is looking at your business. Right. And an objective. And is, right. Front and center. It's something that every single person that walks in your restaurant is going to see, touch, and feel, and imagine, and it, it, there's so many impressions there. It's like, it is the number one thing you should focus on. 
That's right. And you want someone who is objective. Like I don't, right. with regard to Hobra or any other restaurant operator I work with, I don't have any vested interest in what you're selling. So as an example, you can get a review like this from Cisco or you can get one from US Food Service. They'll, they'll do this for you. They'll, they'll work on it. The problem with it is they have a vested interest in their business. They're interested in you. They see you differently. They're not as objective. Now, I'm not dissing those guys. I'm just saying that they want to sell cases. And that's the reason they're doing it. I don't sell cases. I'm not terribly interested in that. What I'm interested in is making sure that you make more money because if you do, you're going to come back to me and say, Mark, what do you think I should do next? That's how I make my living. And I make my living because, uh, you know, because I have a restaurant at Smoking Pig Barbecue as an example, and he calls, he gets a call from his buddy and says, hey, you should use a hot operator because they did a great job for me. You're missing your 15%. You better get it. And then he opens a new restaurant, you know, and he goes, hey, uh, you know, this other guy, you should talk to him. He's really great. He, you know, you can really help him grow his business. That's how I get my business. I'm not doing it because I'm selling you cases. So you need an objective viewpoint. It's, I cannot stress this enough. You need somebody who's going to look at your business just for you mm -hmm. and say, is this working for you? I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't care, um, you know, where you're buying the cases from or all that. What I do care about, though, is when you buy something from a distributor, make sure that it's consistent. Make sure that if you're buying something, like one of the things I always say, and I, and I plug uh, companies sometimes this way because it's not because I'm being endorsed by them, but if I say, look, buy Dyson, Tyson chicken or buy something, buy a fry, a fry from Sim Simplot or Lamb Weston or somebody, the reason I do that is because you know it's in that case. They can't switch that out. But if you get a private label brand from a distributor, you don't know what's in that case. You just never know. Correct. And if they switch that out, they're not going to tell you. No, it's inconsistent and the customer will notice Exactly. And one of the things you don't want to get in a restaurant, is something called mission drift. Now I did a study uh, years ago uh, for uh, Pillsbury and they, they sell those big cathead biscuits all through the South and they were losing market share and they were wondering, well, how's that happening? What's going on back down there? And what was happening is, distri is distributors were going out and saying, Hey, look, why don't you try switching from the Pillsbury brand to this private label brand? I'll save you five bucks a case. And what they were telling the restaurant operators is just go ahead and try this. Right. And, if no one complains, you just save five dollars a case, and the just and the restaurant operator would go, all right, I'll try it out. So they would try it. Nobody said anything, and they're like, hey, I'm saving five bucks a case, so I switched from Pillsbury to this other brand, right? Yes. Now they came back the next week and said, well, what about your hash browns? Let's take a look at those. And what about your bacon? I know you're using Hormel, but you don't have to use Hormel. You could use my private label brand. Now here's what happened from the consumer perspective. The consumer perspective over time was they would go into the restaurant, they're eating there, and suddenly they're like, you know, it's something different here. I don't know what it is, but it's just not as good. A little different. Just a little different, right? But it stands and, out. It's a lasting impression. Exactly. Now what they say is, I'll give it a couple more tries. Maybe it just had an off day. Who knows, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then they come back. Now the bacon is different. And they're like, what the hell is going on here? House of cards. Yeah. Now, they don't say anything to the restaurant operator because they don't know. They don't know what it is right? Well, I do because I do know. I mean, when I go to a restaurant and I know they change something, I'll say something to the manager. I'm like, why did you change the biscuit? The hell are you thinking? Right? But well, most people, the way it was. But, well, most people aren't in the restaurant business, so they don't know, right? Correct. What happens though, and this is the worst death you can have, Roger, is mission drift because what happens is people stop coming slowly over time and six months from now, you're standing there holding your hat going, where did everybody go? What happened? Yes. Exactly. Now, and I point this out because this happened, uh, you'll, and you'll see just uh, this in the news uh, just recently, there's a, a restaurant, uh, there's a chain uh, called Noodles and Company. Right? I know that oh, chain. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Years ago, you'd go there, you'd buy something, you'd get this really wonderful dish, right? I started to notice maybe about a year and a half ago that it was noodles, but not much company, right? It was just a bunch of noodles, but not much sauce and not much meat. And I noticed, so what I did is I started looking at it and I started weighing the meat and the meat was slightly going down every time I went. So it went from like about a five ounce portion to a four and a half ounce to a four ounce. And then the last time I was there, it was like a 3.8 ounce portion. I actually took it home and weighed it because I'm like, what the hell are they doing? So over time, their sales have been off. And if you read in the news, their sales are off, right? And they're like wondering, well, why is the sales low? And now they're coming back and they're saying, well, we probably should, you know, do something with the food. Yeah, like put the in company back in the noodles, right? The problem is you've just hurt your business. So over time, what's going to happen is like, I haven't been there in years now because the food sucks. It's just noodles with a little sauce, 
You got to be really careful with this sort of thing. Don't change the product. Really powerful point you just made. Right? Mission drift. It'll kill your business. So anyway, that's a tip from your Uncle Mark and your Uncle Roger. Kiss of death right there. Pay attention, folks. He's right. All right. Now, going forward, a couple of things. If you want me to do a menu matrix for your business and be on restaurant stock rock stars, reach out to Roger, reach out to me. We'll do this. We'll have you on the call. You can be on here with us. You can be a star, baby. Give it a shot. Let's see how it works. That'll be a lot of fun. All right. Roger, anything else? I'm going to put a special link in my show notes that uh, people can reach out to you if they're interested in everything we're talking about here, which I absolutely recommend because nothing is more important than your menu. One is a marketing piece and two as a profit tool. Okay. You've made that very clear today and you brought the whole process to life, but I recommend everyone check this out because again, a small investment for a huge ROI and that's the bottom line. It is. And Chris King, Thanks a lot for being on our show today. You've got a great restaurant concept. I wish you all the best. And honestly, I could see hundreds of those. In fact, I want one in my uh, hometown. I really do. I want to go. I, too. I would I wanna, absolutely go there. Yeah, I want to go to your restaurant every week. So if you want help building a franchise and building a restaurant, reach out to us. We can help you with this. We can make you a rock star. All right. Hey, Roger, thanks for having me on the call today. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, and we'll see you in the next episode. Guys, all I can say is, wow. I hope you're all running right out to redesign your menu because you can lose so much money with your current menu if it's not designed for maximum profit. So check out hotoperator.com, reach out to my buddy Mark Locks, and tell him you heard of us at restaurantrockstars.com. You know, for more money-making tips, you know, subscribe to the podcast. It's free on iTunes. Or you can just come to our website, opt in, and get it for free in your email box every single week. And if you're looking for more ways to maximize your restaurant profits, don't miss restaurantrockstars.com for all our resources on taking your operation to the next level and maximizing your profit. We'll see you next time.